And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, getting my mentally ready to fucking destroy somebody. <laughs> and I look back at him like, what's CTM? And he's like, chinga tu madre. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. And our life would never be the same. Yo, welcome everyone to another (laughs) 20 minute chat with Galaxy Boy. But I don't know, we might we might be going to We're gonna be going easily, easily. (laughs) Anyway, <laughs> let me introduce this guy, and I'm gonna let him go, man. He's, he's ready to go, man. Um, I got a legend in this building. Thank we're, you, man. We're definitely one of the king of the cities in this building. The, the one he's holding the key for the door for a lot of these artists. Um, that legendary voice. I mean, like, it, it, I'm pretty sure he walks in the room. People are like, "What's that voice?" Absolutely. And so. Man, he's putting the he's putting in crazy work. He's he, <laughs> twenty plus years in the radio and what he's been doing, and he does it good. No further ado, Blaze. <laughs> Blaze from Hot ninety nine seven. Jeez, Louise, uh, you know Welcome, Blaze from dude. Elm Street. Really is where my origin is from the city of T Town, and um, you know I want to let people know where I'm from. That's why I got I'm repping the the zip code. You know I, uh, we're gonna get into a lot of stuff, but I'm out the city of T Town, which is. Uh, why that interview between you and AM I saw recently was so special to me, man, because this this guy is so talented along with their whole mess of room movement and stuff. And, um, you know, a lot of us always think it's all about Yakima, but Yakima, we coming, cabrones, we're on your ass, <laughs> motherfuckers. And so it's so awesome to see AM and his team, shout out to Big Tone and Dave Certified and them, and uh, they didn't quit and they didn't stop that consistent. We were talking about but as I pulled up and their their mind to invest in themselves and to continue to just hone their craft and their skill, you know. Mm-hmm. And, man, I've known them guys since they were little guys, you know <laughs> what I mean? And years later, you skip it 10, 15 years, and I'm hearing them now, and I'm just like, who are these guys? And the whole time is them, and I know them, you know. So shout out to the homies, and I just want to put T-Town on the map, man, and make us proud. And um, res life, putos, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> But I rep everybody. And I repped every neighborhood, man. I go through everything you guys do, and it was just real important with, with what I was trying to create mm. damn near 20 years ago when I got on air, that feeling of that neighborhood vibe, that it's not just one of us, mm. it's all of us, seriously. But mm. thank you for having me here in that introduction, man. I don't think about the 20 years I've put in. Yeah. And that's just radio. That's not a side of all the artists i've talked to and met and interviewed and the street team stuff i used to do so where does it start where in your eyes where does your journey start it starts before the radio does it start before the chasing the money thing absolutely where does it start for you in your eyes um as a kid i always knew i was going to entertain man I, i i was just always trying to be the funny guy in our house we all became funny but um <laughs> i was the one who really knew that's what i was gonna do and i always thought i was gonna be an actor and a comedian that was my lane and um uh, but i loved music growing up i danced as a kid to every single song and everything and just eventually music would take me over like i would just collect every single i possibly could on cassette and 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 the music you start falling in love with music when you hear it the right way in a Mm. car with a system with bass so that's kind of where my older brother comes in Mm. as he turns into his teenage years and i'm still a young and i'm hearing that bass and i'm hearing my favorite songs in the ride it was a old school dots and b210 and uh it had a bungee cord that would hold the trunk down because the lock was broken, right? Oh, shit. And here we got like $1,500 worth of equipment in there, you know, and it's, it's just hidden with a bungee cord, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that's really where the music, I got more enticed as far as like heading more into the DJ direction. And then I just, as my collection grew with music and everywhere I went, whether it was a buddy's house or they would come over, I was always the one who was trying to have like the latest song or single or album or project have you heard this guy so i've been doing i've been breaking artists in the hood for since i can remember you know what i mean and then that's kind of where you know i fell in love with jam master j that is like my who the the dj to run dmc probably one of my idols bro and um from there i watched what he was doing and i would never afford a turntables i was too young to work Mm. my parents weren't gonna buy me no turntables i mean we we grew up working in the fields and uh so there was no money for that and and at that time parents you know i guess from the time you know those 80s periods if you were 
immigrante and stuff, you know, you're, you're considered old school and you have an old way of thinking like, yo, you don't need that. As long as you have a, a roof over your head and you got food and clothes, you don't need shit, you know? And I guess they just kind of lived on a mentality more like, yo, don't ask for too much because you don't need it, you know? Mm. And I needed it. I needed it. I, I always knew as a kid that I was going to be something or somebody in this entertainment field. And it's crazy. I would switch from uh, being a comedian actor, which I've always been funny. I still clown and I, you know, I am a comedian in my ways. And, um, but the music just won me over and I just got good at playing music and being at parties and, and being a hype man. And, and I learned all that stuff from, like I said, Jam Master J and DJ Kid Capri. Um, dang, I'm missing Grandmaster Flash and just these guys that were the evolution of what the next tier of a DJ could do because back in the day the DJ just shut up and played the beat you know what I mean for the rappers or the artists and they were kind of the ones on the mic but it went to like Jam Master J and Kid Capri and these other guys I mentioned uh they became they became kind of like the hype man and the DJ like yo yo y'all ready for run DMC are we gonna rock with y'all tonight just like combining combining yeah bringing bringing a personality and a character to a DJ and I fell so in love with that shit dude I was just like oh my god this is this is just insane <laughs> right because it's the evolution of the old DJ turning to like yo like slash hype man and MC you know and. Mm. And and then it kept going, you know, DJ Clue and uh, Big Mike and Funkmaster Flex and, um, you know, believe it or not, Felly Fell was one of my favorite LA DJs. And, and you just start hearing more of this evolution travel more. And I was like, it's here. It like, This is the, the the DJ level I have to be at if I want anybody to take me seriously. And, and, and although I didn't have turntables, I still had my cassette player playing the music. But while I'm talking, I already have my cassettes lined up and my singles, what was I was going to play next. Mm. So I'm buying time because I can't mix records. I don't have a mixer. I don't have turntables. So again, just kind of like what we talked about, like use what you got to get what you're trying to get to or create. And so I'm like, just, yo, y'all ready? Keep partying. And I'm looking for my next song that I'm about to play. Yo, I can't hear you. Y'all looking for the next, you know what I'm saying? And, and um, that's how I... Kind of started developing the vocal skill. Were you running parties with a cassette tape? Is that what you're yeah. trying to tell me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, with a single cassette player. And so the song would fade out. I would stop, pop it out, do my bit, you know what I mean? Get, get, do my character and get the next cassette in there going. And, and it was just about like 10 seconds, maybe eight mm. second gap there. But me just verbalizing and feeling that downtime there, mm. people would just be like, who is this guy? And then my voice started developing, you know what mm. I mean? I just had an energy to me, but eventually as I continued to do that throughout the years, my teenage years, my voice would just become prominent and dominant, you know, mm. everywhere I went with that. And um, that's really where it started. And and music, I just love music. I love old school. I, I don't mind what the new folks are doing. I think if you give people... Anybody, for that matter, a little bit of time of what they're trying to do and you just pay attention, kind of like what I did with you. And you start seeing that these people do have something special to them and, and they've been working at their craft that for some time. And you end up falling in love with somebody. It's kind of like when you see the players in, in college and you see them go to the pros and you're like, man, I remember when I used to watch them uh, – in college, you know, and some people here even from high school, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, look at Cooper Cup. Like, what an amazing story that is. And all because he stayed consistent and didn't give up and stayed working at his craft. And look, this guy could possibly bring home the biggest trophy in all of sports. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. Right here for you. <laughs> Come on. I'm like, I'm not a Rams fan, but shout out to Cooper Cup. God mm -hmm. dang, man. What an, what an amazing story. But uh, that's kind of what my mentality was like growing up, oh, man, I, I love this and it's still entertaining and I'm still funny because I would always say dumb shit, funny stuff to make people laugh during those breaks. And then as I'm having conversations anyway and talking to people, we're just clowning and, and having fun. So mm -hmm. in a way, I, I still am a comedian I've, I've, and I, I've done some movies and stuff and I've been in some film projects growing up. And uh, so I did do some acting, you know what I mean? I never took it to where I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I want to share with people like... Uh, go as far as you can go because you're your only limit. You know, you're your only limit for this. I'm my only limit as far as what I was going to do at hot. And imagine I give up my first year in, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like you walk into radio, I walk into radio about, about 20 years ago. And I think, cause I know hip hop that I know radio, you know, and mm -hmm. it's a business. Radio is a business, man. They ain't hiring me to be hip hop. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Which was a hard pill to swallow at first, but my boss believed in me and he saw my passion at that time. But, 
before I get too far ahead, um, so that's where the music and the entertainment piece of me develop. At a very young age, I just knew I was gonna be an entertainer. I love, I love the fact that uh, I was able to make people laugh because you know we grew up not poor, poor, but just getting by, you know. And my parents are migrantes, so we would grow up in the fields. And obviously, at that time, you're getting five dollars an hour. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Probably, sheesh, what are you gonna get with five dollars an hour? But it was what it was, and um. I just just kind of used comedy as a way to to cope with some pain I was going through during those times growing up as a kid, understanding, hearing my parents fight about bills and mm. this money this and money that. And, uh, man, it just seemed, it seemed to be like a real constant con conversation in my home. And I hated – it got to the point where I just hated hearing it anymore. And I just decided, how, what can I do to help? You know what I mean? So I've been working since I was a young kid. And I got into the OIC program at about, like, 15 years old. And that's kind of was I got my first official jobs and I would give my parents my checks. You know what I mean? They weren't crazy checks or nothing because you can only work part time. But, you know, that affected me for a long time. And and that also fueled me down the road. You know, first you're like, why are we going through this? And man, I hate life. And why God, you know, but um, I also used it as fuel to turn me around like, nah, man, I'm 15 now. I can work. I can get some sort of a job. I'm going to change our situation at home. And so mm -hmm. since a young kid, I've always been a hustler and work hard. And uh, I was always just that guy. You know what I mean? I always wanted to see my parents happy, even if I couldn't do much. But just the fact that I was doing it helped alleviate that coping pain a little bit, too. It was like, man, I'm too busy. I'm working to think about what's really going on at home. But... I used it, again, because a lot of us go through that growing up, and we just don't know what to do with that energy, right, that negative energy, and then we start destroying ourselves, you know what I mean? We mm -hmm. start getting into the dope and uh, the alcohol and, you know, the, the relationship between you and your parents starts dissolving, and, and you don't think they love you, and it's just too much anger at home, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And uh, I always knew my parents loved the. It just wasn't the, the conversations I wanted to hear, you know what I mean? But... Uh, that's where things started. And that's why I really like, man, I got to be funnier. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got to, I got to, I got to turn this negative into a positive. I got to make people smile. I got to. So like basically middle school is where I really, really developed like that, that, that entity I wanted to be of just using comedy to change people's day around, you know, if that's all I could do. And, um, you yeah, know, I obviously became the class clown of the year three years in a row and shit and, uh. <laughs> Uh, you know, but even then hip hop was always still a part of that, you know, music was mm -hmm. still kind of something I could go to and pretend I was this jam master J and, um, and just, again, just coping, just, it was another way to help cope and forget what was going on at home and the mm -hmm. struggles there and stuff. Cause I have four siblings and now that I got two kids of my own, mm -hmm. it is not easy raising kids. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you had four cabrones on top of that Jeez. and on top of that stress. And mm -hmm. so I, as I'm older now, I can reflect and be like, well, damn, yeah, I could see how we had an effect there too, man. You got mm. four wild and ass kids. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when you hit those teenage years, geez Louise, man, it's like almost like some Swiss turns on like, yo, let me go fuck up my life, you know? <laughs> let me go start fucking up on purpose <laughs> and, and and make my, my parents even more pissed and, oh, and, 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 and unproud and yeah. uh, just fuck, man. My dad's one of them old school dads. and um, Whoop your ass, man. Huh? Yeah, and if you don't work... He was two things. Si no trabajas, si no sabes español, no vales verga, güey. You know what mm. I mean? And for those you don't know, maybe you shouldn't know, but <laughs> he was basically saying, hey, you either work, you talk Spanish, or you ain't shit. And, and man, he would draw all my friends. I'm like, dad, we're 12. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, they ain't hiring us no matter where I fucking go. He's like, man, go mow a lawn. Go rake the yard. Go go get some fucking money. But don't just be standing in here playing with your fucking cornhole all day and doing nothing, <laughs> playing with G.I. Joe's and your pecker, you know? So, um, but yeah, it, and, and and that's instilled in me. My dad taught us to work young. I was I was waking up in the asparagus fields at like six years, five years old, you know? Yeah. And um, sheesh, Luis, you know, uh, I've came a long way, man, from that. But to be able to tell my stories really, like I told you, I want to yeah. inspire, man, because there's so many people who go through it in their own way, obviously. But... I was able to figure out my niche and and use that as um, as a leading energy for me to get me out of this ruckus I felt I was growing up in, just personal family things and just feeling like we're just broke and poor and, not, and, and just all those struggles, man, that come with it. But 
it was the entertainment piece I wanted first. I wanted to make people laugh, entertain, and music mm. just eventually just kind of kept, it would stay in my life. It wouldn't go nowhere. All my collection of music would stay with me. And, and you know. So, I, so when's the Chase the Money era start for ooh. you? Well, in, I graduated in, in 95 and I didn't know what I wanted to do yet. And that's about the time when like, the street and the gang activity was really getting hot here in the valley, like mm -hmm. just real hot. And I mean, it, you couldn't help but turn left. These guys are gangbangers now. You know, mm -hmm. they weren't nothing two weeks ago, and now they're gangbangers. You go this way, they're gangbanging. You go this way, these guys are Norteños now. You go this way, these guys are Sureños. And it was just like, man, that ninety that nineties takeover of the gangbang thing was for real. Like it just got to the point where you were guilty by association now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that's what happened to us. Mm -hmm. And we were cool with all these people we'd known all our lives from partying. And, and I used to break dance too with a brother of mine and stuff. And so they just, I was just in party mode. But even in party mode, man, this gang thing wouldn't leave me alone. Like I said, you're guilty by association so, because I grew up with these people. And obviously, I don't care if you gangbang or not. I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't realize that that would come back to haunt me because, again, guilty by association. And, and nobody's going to take the time to be like, hey, Blaze, do you gangbang or not? And yeah. why did I see with you? They just saw me and it was on site. What's up? What's up? Just started me up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that was weird. You know what yeah. I mean? They know me. They know I don't gangbang. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But because... You're they associated. saw me and I'm associated and, and it would get worse. The gangbanging thing was just to start and then the dope game mm. would enter the scene and now you got both and now you can't get around it. But the, the CTM was always a mentality my dad taught me, you know what I mean? As I started explaining to him what was going on with the street stuff, um, he just would tell me, man, fuck them dudes. Mm. Ching and su madre, you know what I mean? Mm. Fuck them and their mom. They, they, they didn't shit. And I was like, all right, but I don't know if that's the right answer, but okay. <laughs> and as that gang shit really happened, like now it's like on site. Like everybody's just mm. really putting, putting me and my team, my brothers and the friends I grew up with, mm. like, okay, well, we saw you with some Norteños. Now you're Norteños now. We mm. saw you with LVLs. Now you're LVLs. They didn't even know what to put us in no more, right? Yeah. Like it was just like every weekend we're at a new party, still hanging out and partying and stuff. And we're just at a location where these guys claim a certain thing and I didn't I never cared bro I I never cared about gangbanging I just it's mm. it, I guess it was cool in a way like yo man that guy's down mm. but I just didn't like the, re the the end result mm. you know what I mean people who grew up with each other killing each other you know you mm. know what I mean and then you even as you got as I did my homework on it I was like man you got fools who claim blue killing each other from claiming blue too so yeah. what the fuck like I just never I never got into that that was never for me but it came a point one time where they were just like no you guys are fucking gang banging and we're gonna force you into it mm. and so one day we were threatened on elm street and um that's where we grew up on and that's where we always hang, hung out our mm. posse and they you know the one day they, they just kind of we heard through the street vines that they were gonna come and fuck us up there mm. and um so we were ready we're like we don't want to do this we're just a party crew and a group of guys who love to kick and have a good time but we're not gonna let nobody come to elm street and yeah. do no shit you know what mm -hmm. i mean like well, this is our turf and i was like forced again i never want to game and i'm almost like forced into it this forced. at this day yeah this day and so we're all there with bars and bricks and <laughs> knives and uh back then you would have like bats and you know uh there was really no guns we didn't have a gun at that point um but we were we, we were ready to go and one day I tell my brother, I'm like, man, dude, I don't, I can't even believe we're gonna have to do this to the homies because we know these guys. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, bro, what is wrong with you guys? You know what I'm saying? So we're on Elm Street waiting for these clowns to come, you know, bust us up, like they said they were. And I look back at my brother, because again, we're not CTM yet, mm. right? We don't have a name, we're not a gang, we're just a group of party guys and uh, mm. you know, b-boys and hip hop lovers and <clears throat> So I'm telling my brother, man, I can't believe we're going to have to do this to the, the homies. You know what I mean? And he's like, ni modo CTM. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, fuck them, man. I'm just kind of behind my, my second mom's, because we're at her house waiting for these guys. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, getting my mentally ready to fucking destroy somebody. <laughs> and I look back and I'm like, what's CTM? And he's like, chinga tu madre. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! And our life would never be the same. We were now CTM. So before chasing the money, we're chinga tu madre. Now no we, we're way. sick of your shit. We're done. We're not. Nobody's gonna fuck with us. Nobody's gonna fuck with us now. And they and they couldn't. They couldn't. 
And so then from there, <clears throat> our posse got bigger. There was a lot of people who felt the same way we did at that time. Like, yo, it kind of came from survival. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We had no choice because now they're like, we're going to go to Elm Street and fuck with y'all. And we're like, the fuck you are? Like, we, again, forced that hand. And um, um, unfortunately, our posse would grow, you know? Not unfortunately. It was a good thing at that moment. Mm. Unfortunately, this thing was taken serious, you know? And, and, and it would just grow. And it, it was just kind of turned into a bigger party crew. But now we're down, dude. Whatever you want. You want, you want the green light? You want the beef? You want to... You want to cook something right now? Let's go, you know? Mm -hmm. And that would change CTM again and, and force our hand. And we, like, people started saying, like, yo, they're, now they're this. And it was good because, fuck, I got tired of being put in all these other gangs we were never in. So now we have our gang, you know, mm -hmm. which it did start as a gang. And we, we would transform into our family, you know what I mean? Uh, I didn't grow up with no family members just my immediate family i had no aunts uncles cousins none of that shit mm. growing up so these guys from ctm would turn into my family you know what i mean mm. they still are but as we continue to uh do the the b-boy thing and the hip-hop thing and i continue to play music for us and rap got stronger because the 90s game and the west coast game mm. got stronger so now this rap thing uh rap Gangster rap and gangster shit is for real like mm. there's no avoiding this no more like you either gang bang mm. Or you're gonna get fucked up if you if you don't have somebody to back you up because that's just how it was. It was almost like people just needed to fuck somebody up <laughs> for the sake of doing it to say that their gang was tough. Yeah. And even if you weren't gang banging, they didn't care. They were drunk and high, and they were just gonna fuck with you until shit went down. You know what I mean? And um, again, we would be put in a lot of those positions after CTM was born. And um, but it wouldn't be till about a decade later. So we did the dope thing. Eventually, the gang thing just leads into more negative shit. And, the, and that's where the dope game kind of comes in, right? And obviously, everybody I knew in the game, a dope game, sorry, the gang thing was, was son or kids from immigrantes, you know? Mm -hmm. So there is no money at home. So again, almost survival again. You're like, what? I got some weed. I got some cocaine. I got... Whatever it was, trying to get the next money. At that time. And... Um, Eventually, methamphetamines would show up. Crank, you guys call it ice now, but twenty years ago, it was a methamphetamine. Some fucking crackhead was making it in, in his house and literally hitting the street with it. And it eventually would come across our hands, and we would experiment with it. Not not that it became our favorite thing to do, but mm. I mean, it was moving and grooving and shaking and baking, and it was getting around. And man, for ten years we did that, bro. Just dope game. And I got involved with a gal whose family was really, really into the dope game. Like, I didn't know that at first. Yeah. And she never really put me onto it. But as me and her uncle became closer, he would really show me what it was about. Mm -hmm. And he had the money to get this, like, in bigger amounts than I've ever seen, you know. And, um, again, uh, the, the, the dope game would it would get stronger you know nobody even cared about gang no more it's like we gotta just make money finally <laughs> right but it's it's like been t 10 years now and it mm. it was good and bad because you know i i started seeing the gang activity kind of calm down and people weren't trying to fuck each other up so much mm. but we're doing it in a different way anyway feeding mm. poisoning ourselves in the streets with this shit and um i didn't realize the end effects that would create till it happened to my family till yeah. my little brother started getting strung out and becoming people I didn't want them to become. And um, that's really the time when we, we were growing up and my brother Magic, shout out to my brother Magic, he would, well, no, it gets even deeper. Here's a piece you don't know. Mm. So before we're chasing the money, I create the Stone Kings. Mm. You ever hear of the Stone Kings? No. They became a pretty popular group here locally for a moment. And one day we're at a homie's, the girl I was with at the time had a cousin and her boyfriend loved hip hop and thought about making beats. He was the one who was always freestyling. We were just always like wanted to rap. Mm. So me and my brother Magic would always hang out with him because my girlfriend, his girlfriend lived next door. So that's how we met him. He would all, Magic would hang with me, but we would meet this guy through the girlfriend of mm. my girl and um, or the cousin of my girl, sorry. But <clears throat> we're just always smoking and drinking and listening to music. And one day we're like, man, you think we could rap? Mm. And I was already kind of like a tagger at that time. Like, I'm a b-boy. I do all elements of hip-hop. And hip-hop saved my life from the art, the DJ and you know, the MCN was next at that moment. And um, so I was part of a 
tagging crew called SKT, Stone King mm-hmm. Taggers. And we're there for weeks just trying to figure out a name for our rap group. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just kind of took the, the tagging crew and I changed it. I'm like, what about SKS? And he's like, SKS? I'm like, yeah, what about Stone Kings? Mm-hmm. And they were like, yeah, man. <laughs> bro, I, bro, I got to light this out. <laughs> and my brother Magic, God, I, I never knew he would had a writing skill, right? Mm. God damn, this guy starts writing everything and Stone King's this and Stone King's that and and it just worked. Mm. Well, that's probably 97, 96, 97. And it wasn't until about 99 when I move, I, I'm pretty much leaving this group now. I'm leaving Stone King's and my brother Magic and have you heard of Big Rass then from the Stone King's? You, no, I no, haven't. Okay, you, I'll, I'll, I'll put you up on that. Put but me on, put me on. He kind of takes over while I leave, right? I'm at, I'm at this moment, I'm, I guess a young man crisis, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm 21, something like that, 22. And I'm tired of being at a warehouse. I'm tired of working in the fields. I'm tired of just working at these shitty jobs. And I'm like, I could, I know I'm supposed to be somebody, you know what I mean? And an opportunity comes where a guy was carpooling with, carpooling with, uh, wants to go back to Phoenix, Arizona. And this is 1999. He's trying to convince me to go with him and go with him. And man, I ain't never left the hood. You know, I never left down the street, let alone yeah, come on top. And I was like, I don't know nobody out there. What happens? You know, all those negative things. Yeah. And finally the day comes and he's like, bro, you're either going to go with me or you're going to stay here on the fucking res doing this shit forever. Mm. And I talked to a lot of big homies because I was nervous to leave. And they were like, bro, you have no kids. You're not married. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have car payments. Get the fuck out of here. Make us proud, you know, because they knew I wanted to entertain. And fuck it, I'm leaving. And even though it was a good move for me at that time, it would change everything in CTM. Like, it would just change because I'm, like, pretty much the big brother from Elm Street and from CTM. And so I've had my little brothers who are, like, four or five years younger than me running with me since they were like 10 you know six seven eight but finally at 10 now they're running with us up and down and they're they're watching what we're doing with the alcohol and the, and the weed and the drugs and um and the i didn't realize down. that later Only it will come back to haunt feel.